Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Beth, and today I just finished reading The First Men in the Moon by H.G. Wells. This will conclude my H.G. Wells saga, and I will have to say this was my favorite of the bunch. This was published in 1901 and is about 300 pages long, so it is his longer works. I think this actually beats out the island of Dr. Moreau for me just because he was able to incorporate more into this book. And there was really interesting writing structure going on. So you have basically three parts. The first part is centered on Earth. The second part is on the moon. And the third part is the moon but without the narrator. Which gives me um, Alfred Hitchcock 1960s psycho vibes when, you know, Alfred Hitchcock killed off his main character 20 minutes in. It definitely reminded me of that, especially due to the fact that there is a fake out end scene in this book. You know it can't possibly be the end because there's still about 50 pages left. But it's really interesting that that's how it's written. It basically says, I'm done. I'm going to publish this book now, which... I thought it was a bit of fun, even though I personally knew it wasn't a spoiler to say that it was the end of the book. I think that a huge part of this novel is this um, war between business versus science. So you have our main narrator, who is a businessman, who basically went bankrupt and decided to go out into this um, faraway town to write a screenplay. And he comes upon this really odd scientist. And when the scientist encroaches on his writing routine, he basically comes up to him and says, you're really weird. <laughs> Don't do what you're doing because it is distracting me from my important work. And the scientist is really thrown off by this and he feels very self-conscious and his whole routine is ruined. And so a way to combat this, our main character, Mr. Bedford, he basically says, hey, you can talk to me instead. I'm sorry for ruining everything. But as he listens to the scientist, um, Carvin, he learns that Carvin is not just a mad scientist. He has this great idea for a metal of sorts that is able to basically defy gravity. And once again, you have H.G. Wells' wishy-washy science in which there is some kind of basis there, but it's not exactly explained. It's more of just one paragraph to explain how he thinks science will work in. So, you know, take it or leave it. It is just science fiction. It's not actual science. But I will say um, it's just interesting to hear more of whimsy in sci-fi. You especially get to see that on the moon in which, you know, you have the moon, which we all think is like a barren rock. That's how we all know of the moon. But according to this book, when the sun shines on it, all of a sudden there's these huge stalks of vegetation that grow, grow and bloom everywhere. And then once it goes to the dark side of the moon, it all just dies and then it will be reborn in the next lunar day. And I just love the fact that a lot of this science is more of just what men imagined what things could be like. It's not exactly based on anything of fact. I mean, I think during this time, they still believed that the inside of Earth was a vast ocean. That's what you see in um, Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne, which I actually really wanted to reread while reading this because I think I prefer Jules Verne more. But this was still a lot of fun, and I would say it's worth the read. But inside the moon, they're saying that there's vast caverns and a large ocean, so kind of feeding on that same idea that the moon is hollow and the population of the moon, because there are moon folk, they're called selenites. They live inside the moon, but they go out for herding their cattle folk, uh, moon calves, I will say. And I love the way H.G. Wells likes to describe his moon creatures. Because as a human, you have certain aspects which you believe are, you know, aesthetically pleasing. And for, you know, a vast majority of people, when they look at something that looks a slurry mush or almost like an insect, that's what the selenite looks like. They have these very crooked necks and honestly, a lot of their uh, bodies differ from one another. So we have different races, but they actually change the physiology of 
the selenites while they're children so that they can perform specific function society just like you saw during brave new world which i will say they kind of look at it as more of a pro in this book in that um, everybody seems very happy and there doesn't seem to be much of a con other than um the claw which was kind of sticking out of a beaker looked sad to the scientist so not exactly bent down upon this idea of putting some sanctioning someone to a job for life and them having no say in it you also see that these creatures are um if they are smart or leaders they take out uh, the skull so that their brain just continues to grow and i never thought of that as something possible because you know you do often see in sci-fi how aliens are portrayed with you know larger craniums but never exactly just mush and where they have to be wheeled around where they're almost you know useless outside of their certain intellectual tasks so what i will say is hg well loves to just give you these little tidbits of ideas and he he plants a seed but he never actually delves deep under the surface for any of them but it's still really fun to just look through all the different things he loves to think of philosophically. I mean, he even talks about how mothers are adorned here with, you know, beautiful jewels and they're treated as royalty, but they don't have the capacity to love the children they give birth to. So they have a very important role, but it almost gave me the feeling of women giving away their children to nannies is more important than women taking care of their children because the younglings for the moon folk are given away to uh, masculine women and so i think that that's probably just a play of that time period i would have to recommend this book if you really like to just look into how whimsical sci-fi used to be and also just little philosophical ideas that you could kind of plant here and there. If you're looking for something that's more realistic sci-fi, I mean, you can always go to modern science fiction, such as Andy Weir's work works, you know, The Martian, and even Project Carol Mary is very well researched and very much in the realm of uh, believability. But I like the fact that this wasn't exactly something you could believe you know it's very much outside our scope and we just know that could never exist but nevertheless it's so much fun to just think of what if so thanks for uh watching my video hope you have a good day